Welcome and thank you for joining us today. Before I begin though, I need to acknowledge that we are on the land of the Coast Salish peoples, which touches the shared waters of all the tribes and bands within the Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. We also face economic and social challenges that we haven't seen for decades. I recently arrived at the UW, coming here for quite a number of reasons. First and foremost was the excellent leadership, but also the forward-looking attitude of UW and the region, and perhaps importantly, the outstanding faculty, staff, and students at the UW. The provost played a critical role in my decision to come to the UW. Uh, his leadership and racial, ethnic, and gender diversity in STEM is well known. Also, his openness and honesty made it clear that he would be a fantastic mentor. Since coming to the UW, it's really quite apparent that the provost is having a tremendous impact. He's begun a transformation of the UW from top to bottom, both finances, academics, and diversity, equity, and inclusion. The provost, through his leadership, is positioning us to be leaders amongst leaders at the university. I also greatly appreciate the provost's uh, guidance and really stability in this past unprecedented year. Of course, I might be a bit biased as the provost is an engineer. Uh, as many of you know, Provost Richards joined us two and a half years ago um, after a long and stellar career uh, as an educator, uh, researcher, and leader at the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, in addition to uh, being the university's chief academic and budget officer, Mark is also a professor in Earth and Space Sciences in our College of the Environment. Uh, he knows quite well firsthand that all of the work uh, of the faculty and indeed the success of the university would be impossible without graduate students and all of the fellowships that support them. Since I have arrived at UW and begun working with the, Mark, it's very clear that he's shown tremendous support for engineering, including our faculty recruitment and really our effort to build a more inclusive and diverse college of engineering. His actions clearly demonstrate his commitment. Today, Mark will address the importance of recruiting and retaining faculty. He will also highlight our efforts to transform institutional policies and practices and really accelerate system, systemic change at the UW. Thank you for joining us today and please help me welcome Provost Mark Richards. Thank you, Dean Albritton, for your generous introduction. And thank you to our presenters, Juliet Sperling and Ricky Hall, whom I will introduce in just a moment. Thank you to everyone watching today, including Regents Ayer, Jake, Pagosian, Rice, Riojas, and Tamaki. The last time we gathered for a town hall, the world was much different than today. The pandemic was fast approaching. And I noted that it was important, an important time, to meditate on the fact that as a great public university, guided by values of racial equality and inclusion, and of providing an education that is both excellent and accessible, we are an engine of discovery and hope. We occupy a special place and carry a special obligation in our society. That hasn't changed. In fact, I would argue that public universities are more important now than ever. We have seen this in the university's response to the pandemic through research, teaching, and public service. And the response of our UW Medicine, of UW Medicine, our faculty, our staff, and our students, and many others throughout this pandemic has been remarkable. Our researchers from the Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation to the iSchool to public health are quoted daily in the media as experts. Thank you to the back to school and back to workplace working groups, as well as the Advisory Committee for Communicable Disease for advising, for advising leadership, the campus leadership, 
as we make decisions on how and when we will return to our campuses. In terms of emergency aid, our students have submitted more than 6,100 requests for help across our three campuses since March a year ago. This compares to only 625 requests for the previous two years together. Overall, $43 million in emergency aid has been dispersed to more than 21,000 University of Washington students. Most of that is in federal funds, but a lot also comes from our generous donors and from redirected university funds. The response from our faculty has been remarkable as they've shifted from remote teaching just a year ago, <clears throat> and we will see an example of this in just a moment. <clears throat> Today I want to focus on the importance of recruiting and retaining faculty who advance diversity, and the role each of us plays in creating a climate of belonging at the University of Washington. First, we're going to learn about the work and academic life <clears throat> of Jacob Lawrence, a UW faculty member and a world-renowned artist. And we're going to hear about UW's diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts from our Vice President for Diversity and the Office of Minority Affairs and Diversity, Ricky Hall. Then I'd like to discuss why faculty recruitment and retention is so important and some of the plans we have to accelerate those efforts. At the end, I'll address some questions that have been submitted by the University of Washington community. Now, I would like to introduce art historian and assistant professor Juliet Sperling, the Kolar Endowed Chair in American Art. Dr. Sperling is in her first year at the University of Washington, and like many of you, she has been teaching her courses remotely. She earned her PhD and master's degrees in history of art from the University of Pennsylvania. Her research and teaching are on three intersecting thematic areas the art and material culture of North America from colonial settlement to the mid-20th century, the theories and objects of media studies, and the construction of categories of race, ethnicity, and difference in visual culture. Dr. Sperling will offer insights not only into Lawrence's work, but how he was recruited to the University of Washington, the impact he had on students, and his experiences as a faculty member. Juliet? Thank you so much for having me. Like Provost Richard said, I just joined the UW as an assistant professor in the School of Art, Art History, and Design this year. It's incredibly powerful to be able to teach and research American art history here, in the same school where Jacob Lawrence, one of the most prominent American artists of all time, also worked and taught, and to do so in a community where his profound impact is visible in so many ways. I'm honored to be here today to tell you more about Jacob Lawrence's legacy in both the history of art and closer to home at our university and why his work matters so much today. In 1993, the faculty of the School of Art were invited to propose a formal title for the art building's first floor gallery. The decision was unanimous. Everyone agreed that the space should honor their esteemed colleague, Professor of Art Emeritus Jacob Lawrence. By that time, Lawrence was already regarded as one of the most important artists of the 20th century. His paintings of American life and history hung on the walls of major museums across the globe, pulling viewers in with a modern abstracted style that you can see here in one of his most well-known works from 1941's Migration series. However, the decision to dedicate a gallery in his name was clearly motivated by more than his art world stardom. As the school's director wrote in a letter to Lawrence, quote, we would all be enormously honored if the gallery were named after you. Your art, your humane values, and your years of service have been a great inspiration for all of those who know you and your work, and we are lucky to count you as one of us. He was right. We are incredibly privileged to count Jacob Lawrence as part of our university's history. But it wasn't luck that brought him to Seattle from his longtime New York City home. Years of deliberate, dedicated organizing and activism by the newly formed Black Student Union and allies set the stage for Lawrence's and several other Black faculty members as hires in the early 1970s. 
and in turn, his time at the UW coincided with some of the first stumbling efforts to acknowledge and begin to combat systemic racism in the university, work that we still grapple with half a century later. None of the books stacked on my desk tell those stories. They're about Jacob Lawrence, the artist, not Jacob Lawrence, the dedicated teacher, generous colleague, or community-minded Washingtonian. As Lawrence's star continues to rise both on campus and outside of it, and as we navigate a moment in our nation and at our university with striking parallels to 50 years ago, it's high time we look at the whole picture. Students in my art history classes first learn about Jacob Lawrence as an artist in dialogue with a long American tradition of history painting. Even if you haven't heard of that genre before, you might recognize some famous examples, like this iconic scene of Washington crossing the Delaware painted by the artist Emanuel Leutze in the years leading up to the Civil War. History paintings took stories from the past and turned up the drama and emotion with heavy handed symbolism. So you can see how Washington literally leads his country out of the darkness and into the light. The goal here was to use the past to teach the viewer a lesson about their present day society's values. When Lawrence began his career, history painting had been out of style for almost a century. But through deeply researched projects like the Migration Series, which captured the mass movement of Black Americans from the South to the North at the beginning of World War I, he resurrected the genre in way the sap, exposing the raw story at the core. Look at panel number three in the series. The travelers huddled together in a central triangle, their bodies forming repeated diagonal lines that indicate their forward motion. We can see echoes of the earlier painting and the way that the scene revolves around that central triangular grouping. But while Washington crossing the Delaware drips with patriotism, like the beams of light that stream from the American flag, Lawrence's scene is spare and straightforward, allowing us to see through to what really matters, the collective weight, physical and otherwise, of the migrant's journey. Lawrence was only 24 years old when the migration series earned him national recognition. Dedicated mentorship from artists including Augusta Savage and Charles Alston, who were part of an older generation often associated with the Harlem Renaissance, helped him get there. Because of those Harlem connections and his frequent depictions of Black subjects, he was consistently characterized as first and foremost a Black artist, a label that he challenged at every opportunity. As he told one interviewer in 1987, quote, I don't consider myself a black painter. I'm an artist who paints blacks. Another multi-panel project begun in 1954 helps us see what he meant. The title, Struggle from the History of the American People, speaks volumes. This is a collective, a national story. In the 10th of 30 panels, reinterpreting pivotal moments in early American history, Lawrence revisits that same famous painting of Washington crossing the Delaware from a fresh point of view. And I mean point of view, literally. Where do we, the viewers, stand to witness history unfold? Instead of gazing up at a glorified General Washington, we've receded deep into the background of the original composition to face the anonymous soldiers whose small boats bob treacherously in the icy waters. There's no singular heroic leader here, just the ordinary people who, as Lawrence put it, struggled to build a nation. History hasn't changed, just how we see it. Starting this Friday, you can see this painting for yourself at the Seattle Art Museum. For the first time in over 60 years, the Full Struggle series is on view to the public in a major traveling museum exhibition that will make its final stop here in Washington. The timing is no accident. Lawrence made this work in the mid-1950s amidst national upheaval around racial inequality and systemic injustice, a moment that mirrors our own current American struggle in too many ways. His art reminds us that the way we tell history matters. It challenges us to revisit familiar stories through different sets of eyes. Lawrence's work is exceedingly relevant today. And I don't just mean his artwork. I also mean the work he did as a university employee and a colleague, 
as a mentor to up-and-coming artists, and as a black professor on a largely white campus. I joined the School of Art, Art History and Design as an assistant professor this autumn, 50 years after Lawrence first arrived as a visiting professor. As I researched his time here, I'm often struck by the resonances between 1971 and 2021, for instance, around recruiting and retaining a diverse faculty and student body. Shortly before Lawrence arrived on campus in the spring of 68, the Black Student Union initiated a wave of actions to begin the long work of dismantling entrenched white supremacy in the institution. By autumn, their unflagging activism had already produced small yet significant changes in the university's population and its guiding principles. One demand was that the university hire more faculty of color in areas including the arts. That fall, committees formed to explore recruitment. In the first weeks of winter quarter 1969, the director of the School of Art picked up his phone to call Jacob Lawrence. Lawrence and his wife, the artist Gwendolyn Knight, moved west with the expectation that they would eventually return east. Instead, Seattle became their permanent home for the next three decades. In Washington, he taught hundreds of students how to express their ideas through art. He made paintings, although not quite as many as he had before. He spoke with authors, scholars, and collectors about his work. And he contributed to the university and its surrounding community through service often through lectures and recruitment events that spotlighted him, first and foremost, as a black professor on a primarily white campus. In ways that I don't have to untangle here, Lawrence's legacy at the UW is bound up with the institution's desire to show progress towards racial equity. And as we call attention to his name, image, and art in 2021, it's critical to acknowledge that complicated history and to recognize that he was a multidimensional person, an active participant in the process of transforming the culture of higher education. So how should we remember Jacob Lawrence's legacy at this university? We could let his art have the last word. In 1972, at the close of his first full year teaching at the UW, Lawrence began a project about his new home. Across five panels, he told the story of George Washington Bush, a man popularly known as the state's first African-American settler. In 1844, Bush and his traveling party headed west on the Oregon Trail to start new lives in an unfamiliar place. I don't think it's a stretch to note the parallels between the 19th century pioneer and Lawrence himself, who had recently made a similar trek towards the Pacific. Before arriving in Seattle, Lawrence and Knight had never been west of Chicago. They left behind one of the largest communities of Black artists in the nation for one that was much smaller. Both journeys presented a balance of struggle and reward. Lawrence couldn't yet paint the ending to his own story, but the closing panel of Bush's saga hints at optimism for the future. In the final scene, which Lawrence titled, Thank God Almighty, Home at Last, Bush and his party have arrived in present day Olympia, Washington. Right away, they get to work, building shelter, sowing seeds, preparing for growth. And now I'd like to welcome Ricky Hall, University Diversity Officer, who is going to share his thoughts on diversity, equity, and inclusion at the UW today. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Spurley. As Vice President of the Office of Minority Affairs and Diversity, my work focuses on access, academic support, and overall success for students from American Indian, underrepresented minorities, first generation, low income, and other underrepresented and underserved populations. As university diversity officer, my role is to work with leadership and others across the university to ensure and facilitate an integrated vision and shared responsibility for advancing diversity, equity, and inclusion. With the goal of creating an accessible, welcoming, supportive campus climate where students, faculty, and staff wanna come and wanna stay. For that to happen, we must create campus communities, be it the physical environment or departmental cultures that suggest we wanted them here, and indeed we have prepared for them to be here. 
It will take that level of intentionality for us to become the type of university we aspire to be. At the University of Washington, the work of diversity, equity, and inclusion long predates my arrival four years ago. It began in the late 1960s with the Black Student Union who demanded that the university consult with the BSU on all decisions, plans, and programs affecting the lives of Black students, that the university recruit more Black, Latino, and American Indian students. The BSU also demanded that the university create and implement a Black Studies curriculum and that the university hire more Black faculty and administrators. In the last 50 years, we have made some progress in attracting students, faculty, and staff who better represent our communities. In the past four years, we have recruited the highest numbers and percentages of underrepresented minority undergraduate students in the university's history. We have more racial and gender diversity among our leadership, specifically our deans and the president's cabinet, than even just a few years ago. And yet, we have fallen short on our faculty diversity efforts. Representation of racial and in some cases gender diversity lags significantly behind their proportions in the country. We have made some small and in some cases no gains. One example, the percentage of black faculty has not increased in a decade. For those of us who care about diversity, this should be distressing. It is disturbing to me and it should be to others that some of the same changes the BSU called for in 1968 are a part of the BSU demands that were submitted to university administration in 2020. Progress, as we well know, can be incredibly slow, especially to students who are with us for a short time. But their prodding, their demands, push us to make change, push us to be better and to do better. Often, they are not the beneficiaries of the changes that they push to create. That has always been the case. It was the case for some of the students in 1968, and it will be the case for some of the students who are demanding change now. And while that is true, it is also true that diversifying the faculty and addressing some of the issues and concerns raised by BSU this past summer cannot wait another generation. The question we all should be asking is how do we accelerate change and ensure that in 10 years, students aren't raising the same issues and concerns that were raised in 1968 and 2020. Many across the university, the state, the country, and world are talking about anti-racism and center and equity. Our challenge is to ensure we go from talk into action, that we have deep conversations about what it means to be an anti-racist college, school, administrative unit and university, and what it means to truly center equity in our work. As was stated in the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities publication, now is the time, meeting the challenge for a diverse academy, we must not only redouble our efforts to assure equal access for all students, but look anew at what diversity can contribute to our learning, our discovery, and our community engagement within the context of our unique institutional histories, traditions, and places. We must determine for each individual and each institution our commitment, our goals, and the pathway to achieve them. If diversity, equity, and inclusion are core values, it is the responsibility of all of us. As many have heard me say, diversity is everybody's everyday work. If we are to create a university transformed by diversity, equity, and inclusion, it will take all of us. Let me share examples of important actions we can undertake together in the next few years. One, review and change policies and structures that limit the success and opportunities for underrepresented populations. Two, critically examine our faculty recruiting, retention, and promotion practices, which Provost Richards will discuss in a bit. Three, increase DEI education and training across the university. We have a responsibility to help people understand what they don't know and to develop new knowledge, skills, and habits that will help them to work more effectively across differences. Four, rigorously explore the university's history of racial, ethnic, and other exclusion as an institution of higher education 
and actively engage the histories of the diverse communities within which our campuses are located. And five, apply an equity lens to all aspects of university decision making, including student, faculty and staff recruitment, student support, policy development, and resource allocation. Throughout this process, it is incumbent that we, students, faculty, and staff, have ongoing communication, be transparent with our work, and hold each other as well as ourselves accountable for taking actions. We must work towards systemic organizational change and comprehensive measures that lead our university diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts to new levels of success and sustainability. We must, too, understand that this work is an ongoing, long-term process that requires constant attention, commitment, and revision. I end with a quote from the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. We are now faced with the fact that tomorrow is today. We are confronted with the fierce urgency of now. In this unfolding conundrum of life and history, there is such a thing as being too late. This is no time for apathy or complacency. This is a time for vigorous and positive action. Now I'd like to turn this back to Provost Richards, who will further discuss why we need to celebrate our efforts and his plans for doing exactly that. Thank you, Ricky, for all of those important reminders of our mission. And thank you, Juliet, for your wonderful presentation on Jacob Lawrence. Since I arrived at the University of Washington a few years ago, I've become quite taken with Jacob Lawrence's work, and a personal favorite of mine is his gorgeous painting entitled Children at Play. Professor Lawrence's presence at the University of Washington was deeply meaningful to our community in many ways. He was one of the greatest American artists of the 20th century, no doubt and an inspiring teacher and role model whose life story and life's work has been an inspiration to the Seattle area and the state of Washington. I invited Dr. Sperling to present and to highlight Lawrence's work and to explore why we should revisit it now. Through Dr. Sperling's research for this presentation, I hope we have all learned more about Lawrence's experience as a University of Washington faculty member. I should mention that Juliet is teaching a, a course next quarter on race and representation in American art, which will include, of course, Lawrence's work. She is also hosting a Kolar American Art Symposium, Legacies and Futures, that will complement the Seattle Art Museum's Jacob Lawrence American Struggle Exhibit, which opened this month. I can't help but make a, a shameless plug at this point also for a project that we are undertaking to renovate the art and music buildings um, here at the University of Washington, Seattle campus, which we are launching with support from the campus and from the College of Arts and Sciences and from generous donors. And a centerpiece of that project, which will soon be underway, is the, going to be a wonderful remake of the Jacob Lawrence Gallery itself to make his work and his legacy more visible to the campus community. As Ricky Hall often reminds us, diversity is everybody's work, every day. For white faculty like me, that work begins by recognizing and acknowledging our privilege and learning to see the world through eyes of others. I grew up in a small and completely segregated town in the Deep South during a regime of white supremacy known as Jim Crow. But segregation, discrimination, and violence were, of course, not exclusive to the South. It is long overdue that we acknowledge the racist roots of the founding of this country, as has been further exposed by recent events, such as the murder of George Floyd and the growing Black Lives Matter movement. Just as Jacob Lawrence examined moments in history from perspectives different from the dominant narrative, we must try to view the world and our university from the perspectives of others. We must continue to evolve toward a vision of a community that honors all its members, 
And this vision can only become a reality if we act now. In particular, it's important for us to deal squarely with the following dilemma. On one hand, some of our norms and standards of academic culture have monastic origins developed for white European males with few family responsibilities, and they bear a legacy of white supremacy and colonialism. But on the other hand, our public universities also inspire us to elevate the lives of all the citizens of our state and nation, regardless of race and ethnicity, and seek to further the highest ideals of a fair and democratic society. In this latter regard, we have a long way to go. When people enter a restaurant or a bookstore or college campus, they can't help but be aware of who is in the room and who is not in the room and what that says about who belongs and who has power. Most places I go, I see people who look like me. As a white male geophysicist, I am very well represented when I go to conferences. It's something easily taken for granted, and it makes it all too easy to forget what others might feel like when they enter a space and see almost no one who looks like themselves and the apprehension that comes with that. It's the same at our university. If our faculty, staff, and students better reflect the people in our communities, our campuses will become more welcoming to all people. If faculty, students, and staff see themselves and their stories in the public art across the campus, the names on the streets and buildings and statues, they are more likely to feel like they belong and they are more likely to succeed. We must learn to extend the privilege of a university education and increase the opportunities for people who have been historically shut out are given over only limited access. We don't want to just look diverse, we want to be diverse, and we want our university to feel diverse. Creating a more diverse university is multifaceted and it is long-term work. We know it doesn't happen overnight. But looking back at Jacob Lawrence's experience, we must ask ourselves, as Ricky Hall just did, if 50 years later, have we made substantial progress? Have things changed for our faculty of color? In my own area of science and engineering, the answer, sadly, for the most part, is no. We while we have made some progress, we are really just getting started on the hard work. And it is time to accelerate our efforts and for all of us to engage in this work and demand that substantial and permanent change is pursued. When I interviewed here, I saw that the University of Washington cares deeply about these issues of race, equity, and inclusion. And it's one of the main reasons I chose to come here. And in the last two and a half years, I've seen the university's commitment deepen, especially in recent months. This work can only be accomplished through true collaboration among faculty, staff, and students across all three of our campuses. This involves the Faculty Senate, deans and chancellors, student leaders, schools and colleges. A couple weeks ago, we announced a faculty diversity initiative. This has been developed with strong support from the Board of Deans and Chancellors and in consultation with the Race and Equity Steering Committee and faculty senate leadership, as well as deans and administrators, and needless to say, is consistent with University of Washington Regents policy. The initiative builds on the work of the Race and Equity Initiative, the Office for Faculty Advancement, and the Office of Minority Affairs and Diversity. But this initiative also builds on the work of individual faculty members who for many, many years have recruited and mentored new faculty. Their efforts, which they often take on voluntarily, in addition to their research, teaching, and service, have laid much of the groundwork for, the, for what we need to undertake next. So here's what we've undertaken so far. Over the next two years, I've designated $5 million in bridge funding 
to help us support the recruitment of faculty at the Seattle campus whose research, teaching, mentoring, service, and outreach will enhance the University of Washington's diversity mission and goals for equity and inclusion. The funding covers up to two years of full faculty salary and benefits with an emphasis on tenure track hires. This step has already spurred our deans to propose and make a number of exciting new faculty appointments, both through this funding, but also separately through their own prioritization of their own resources. Redirecting existing central funds for the recruitment and retention of faculty to focus specifically upon faculty who will advance the campus's goals for diversity and inclusion is also very important. We are going to require, or we are beginning to require, that all faculty searches include statements from the candidates in describing their past and planned contributions to diversity, equity, inclusion. And this is in the process of being codified right now by the Academic Senate for all units on the camp, uh, at the University of Washington. We are also requesting that the deans of all schools and colleges examine whether hiring, reappointment, and promotion criteria for faculty can be changed to support diversity, equity, and inclusion within their units. And this follows the Faculty Senate's own recent Faculty 2050 report that recommends increased consideration of community engagement, outreach, and non-traditional avenues for research and scholarship. Lastly, the University of Washington is hosting a, a new national program with major funding from the National Science Foundation and the Washington Research Foundation to identify outstanding PhD students and postdoctoral fellows from underrepresented groups and to support them as they develop their ambitions and qualify qualifications to become STEM faculty at research universities, including the University of Washington. This effort is led, co-led by Dean Joy Williamson Lott, Professor Julia Parrish, and myself. All that said, recruiting faculty and staff and, and students is not enough. We need to change the campus climate so that they want to stay and that they can thrive here. Therefore, I've asked a subgroup of the Race and Equity Committee to address the following. First, how can we improve the onboarding process for new faculty? Second, how can we enhance the depth and availability and familiarity with data regarding faculty demographics and use those data to up our game? Third, I want us to pay particular attention to the overall climate experienced by BIPOC faculty at the University of Washington, both when they arrive and as they continue to pursue their careers. And lastly, I've asked this group to look at increasing fundraising efforts for endowments to recruit and retain faculty to contribute to the university's equity, diversity, and inclusion goals. Certainly, our students benefit from faculty members whose knowledge and understanding represent the diversity of our state and of our nation. People and communities of our state also benefit from University of Washington's research and scholarship. In a recent NPR interview, Dr. Claudia Rankins, a scientist, National Science Foundation program director, and co-founder of the Society of STEM Women of Color Incorporated, addressed the issue of why we need people of color in science. She says, what would science look like if we had always included those who we, who, who we have been actively excluding? What we study is what we think our communities need, what's important to our communities. What indigenous scholars study would be different from what is currently being studied and would probably benefit the environment much more in many ways. For example, she says, we'd probably have a way to deal with lead poisoning in water and all those other issues that affect black and brown communities. This year, no Nobel Prizes went to BIPOC scientists, although two chemistry prizes and one physics prize did go to women. But there is no doubt in my mind, and there should be no doubt in your mind, that there are BIPOC youth out there right now capable of doing Nobel quality work 
if they only had the opportunity, and our world cannot afford to keep overlooking them. We know this is true because it happens here at the University of Washington every day. Our global research and impact directly benefit communities right here. University of Washington research in population health matters in southeast Seattle as much as it does in Europe. The Foster School is working to revive the economy by helping small businesses in Washington state and around the world adapt and recover. We have a unique opportunity right now to change higher education. We need to ask ourselves what we have learned over the past year and how we can use those lessons to shape the future of higher education. President Kause and I are discussing this with deans and chancellors, leadership, faculty senate, and student leadership. By leveraging technology as a tool for teaching, we can engage students more equitably. Just as the decisions we are making about the pandemic are based on research, decisions about teaching must be rooted in pedagogical theory and research. Our sudden transition to online learning, literally on two weeks' notice last spring, taught us that we can change and adapt poor, perhaps more nimbly than we had ever imagined. So this crisis has become a catalyst for better teaching, better learning, and better access. Last year, at my town hall, I urged that we remember that kindness, acceptance, and understanding go a long way in this world. We will make mistakes, and we will certainly fall short at times. And we will all benefit from each other's care, support, and goodwill. My feelings are exactly the same as we move through this time of multiple crises together as a university and as a community. The work of diversity belongs to all of us every day. So thank you for listening. Now I want to welcome some questions, and I'm going to turn to Jack Martin, our Interim Associate Vice President for Communications, will be monitoring, monitor, moderating the question and answers. Thank you, Provost Richards. Over the past few weeks, members of the UW community have submitted questions for this town hall, many of which I'll be asking today. If your question isn't asked during the Q&A today, rest assured you will get a response directly. Now, we've received several questions regarding the Faculty Diversity Initiative, and so we'll begin our questions there. The first question, and if you want more information about the Faculty Diversity Initiative, you can visit the Race and Equity Initiative website at uw.edu slash race equity. But our first question, Provost, is in regards to the Faculty Diversity Initiative, are financial resources being allocated across all three campuses to do some of the work outlined in the initiative? Uh, that's a very good question to help me clarify some things about this initiative. Uh, an important technical point, each of our three campuses have their own budget. So I am designating funds, for example, bridge funding at the Seattle campus to enhance diversity of our faculty. Um, and uh, we have resources also for instruction, public service, core research functions. The chancellors at Bothell and Tacoma have been developing their own similar initiatives at Tacoma uh, they are going to focus on hiring and supporting clusters of faculty who have expertise and focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion, and social justice. Uh, at Bothell, the leadership has also, like Seattle, designated bridge funding for the next two years to help departments recruit uh, faculty who uh, advance diversity. Of course, we're all working together, and the subgroup of the Race and Equity Committee working on the Faculty Diversity initi Initiative will be looking at issues on all campus on all the campus, but when it comes to the, the budgetary issues that are attached to faculty diversity, those are pretty much the domain of each campus separately. Thank you. Uh, the second question, staying on the topic of something announced as part of the faculty diversity initiative, uh, it's a, it's a two-part question. Uh, first, who is responsible for exit interviews of BIPOC faculty who leave a UW campus? And then secondly, how will that information gathered from these interviews be used? 
Uh, that is also a very pertinent and excellent question to, that uh, goes to the heart in some ways of the uh, issues that don't involve just recruitment of faculty for faculty diversity. I have asked this subgroup again to take up this issue specifically and uh, all issues having to do with retention and climate for, for uh, faculty of color who come to the University of Washington and I've asked this group to take this up and report on uh, accountability metrics and exit interviews and also new efforts we're going to make in faculty orientation and mentoring. Um, I expect that our uh, director of the Office of Faculty Advancement, uh, Chad Allen, will be heavily involved in the exit interview process, but the details of that uh, we are hoping to identify quickly. And uh, honestly, we're hoping we don't have too many exit interviews to conduct. We're going to be working harder to make sure that, that faculty, especially faculty of color, choose to stay here. Our, our next question is from a questioner in the School of Public Health, and it's on a similar topic. Uh, they write, in the School of Public Health, we're hearing that the provost office is curtailing faculty hiring. This presents a challenge to increasing faculty diversity through new hires, which is desperately needed. Could you comment on the motivations for curtailing hiring and how the need to recruit more diverse faculty should be met given this shift? Uh, great question. I need to make a correction. I think a minute ago I said Chad Hall, and I meant to say Chad Allen. Excuse me, Chad. Uh, I happen to know somebody else named Chad Hall, and that comes up often for me. <laughs> um, uh, so this is a question specific to, to, specific to public health and challenges with having faculty positions to offer so that you can diversify the faculty. And of course, that applies to, to all units on campus. All of our units go through an annual process of having a hiring plan approved. And uh, the considerations in that, the first consideration in a hiring plan, of course, is what you can afford and what are your strategic priorities, which will include, of course, diversity, equity, inclusion. Um, so obviously, this past year and probably the coming year are fiscally challenging years. And we have been perhaps more conservative in the number of positions we've been able to offer altogether. Uh, and this is precisely why we added, one of the main reasons we added the uh, bridge funding initiative was to make it possible for uh, schools and colleges and departments to seize upon unusual opportunities that might not fit within their hiring plan but would greatly increase, uh, serve the mission of diversity, equity, inclusion in their units. Uh, and I have to say, I'm pretty impressed so far with not only how the bridge funding initiative has been responded to, but how our deans and department chairs have been using the positions they've been allocated to, uh, to really go after candidates who will increase diversity in their units. Uh, the School of Public Health is, is no different from the other schools, and I will have to give a shout out to Hillary Godwin, who's the Dean of Public Health, for excellent work in this area. Staying on the topic of faculty hiring, a uh, question here from Medicine. Uh, how do we remain competitively agile for recruiting and retaining full-time clinical faculty at UW Medicine? Our lengthy and layered process for approval of faculty positions seems well designed for academic scholars, but makes the clinical enterprise considerably less nimble than local health system competitors for recruitment of full-time clinical physicians, including those from diverse backgrounds. Would you consider not requiring provost level approval for full-time clinical faculty positions? Uh, that's also a great question and allows me to discuss a little bit the fact that, that medicine as a whole uh, especially with the very large um, uh, University, of Medi University of Washington uh, Medical Center apparatus is in fact different from other units in certain ways. Uh, all units, including medicine, go through an annual process, like I mentioned with regard to the question on public health, uh, of, of an annual faculty uh, you know, hiring plan process, and medicine does so as well. Uh, however, within the School of Medicine, there are many, many positions that are what we call positions without tenure by reason of funding, otherwise known as WOT, and also clinical tracks that are not included in the hiring plan requirements and are therefore not reviewed at the provost level when the focus of the work is to be uh, performed in, in a clinically based way and when the, uh, when, the, when the funding for the positions is clinical. So, 
in those many positions that medicine has that are very clinically oriented, uh, we, do not, we do not review those positions for the most part. Uh, shifting gears to um, a question related to state legislature and Senate Bill 5323. Uh, questions are, how would the UW work with Senate Bill 5323 that would freeze the wages and salaries for state employees and require furloughs if it passes? Uh, would it be up to the individual departments or colleges to decide how to work with furloughs? Uh, will the UW have guidelines? Well, I suppose I'm allowed to say that I'm happy that this bill did not advance out of committee before the deadline for committee level consideration, and it means that it's very unlikely to become law. It's not impossible. It could get resurrected if it does, and it did pass. Uh, very unlikely, I think. Then we'd have to be working with our leaders in external relations and planning and budget and deans and chancellors to cope with the impact. But right now, that looks very unlikely. A uh, question about plans for summer. Uh, it's a short question. Why are summer classes remote when you mentioned it'll likely be a mix? And I believe that's referring to January's message that was uh, about the plans for spring, summer, and autumn quarters. That, that's a very fair question. And I understand that there's a lot of eagerness to get back to in-person, uh, not just in the fall, but in the summer. But I should emphasize that basically we're preparing the summer course schedule right now. And therefore, we have to say more or less what we're going to do. Um, and in the previous ac academic year, our summer session was almost entirely in person except for a few courses, clinical courses, studio type courses, et cetera, that could only be done in person. The, most of the courses were remote. In fact, <laughs> Perhaps oddly, maybe surprisingly, we saw a significant increase in summer enrollments last summer. And it's hard to say exactly what the effect of the pandemic was, but it does suggest that making these courses available remotely for summer instruction perhaps has some advantages in terms of, of accessibility and availability for many people. So our summer quarter is probably going to be largely the same as last summer. It, when opportunities arrive, we may convene more in person. But I have to be frank that our focus right now is on what happens in the fall quarter, where we're hoping to be mostly in person, and that's where we're putting most, most of our time and energy right now. Uh, staying on the topic of remote learning, a um, couple of questions here. Um, how are you planning to address learning loss and academic disengagement, especially among less well-off UW students and maybe BIPOC students, after more than one year of remote learning, despite ample evidence that school can be open safely? How do you plan to increase in-person classes in the summer to help some students catch up after more than a year in remote learning? Well, there has been a lot of sense of loss about learning, whether it's K through 12 or college courses, uh, summer sessions, et cetera. And I think that one of the main losses that many of us feel, aside from the courses of instruction themselves, is just the loss of learning communities, uh, things that happen outside the classroom. And uh, one of our hopes for spring quarter, and of course beyond, is that we increase our on-campus opportunities for students to come in for academic support and informal learning and so forth. Uh, the back-to-school group, uh, working group that I mentioned earlier in the town hall, has been discussing a lot of ways to help our incoming freshmen who have been remote learning for more than a year in high school as well as our returning students who spent the last year, at least perhaps their first year at University of Washington learning remotely. Um, these are students, many of which have never, may have never been to the University of Washington campus before. This is going to be a challenge. Uh, their learning has been impacted and we're going to have to learn how to help them uh, make the transition back to you know, perhaps a, a more normal uh, state of, of learning at the University of Washington. Again, as for the summer courses, uh, we are going to have mostly remote summer instruction with some in person, but again, our main focus is to do our very best to get as much in person as we can for the autumn quarter. We expect and hope to be mostly in person for autumn quarter, uh, and uh, of course that's going to depend on vaccination rates and the spread of the virus and the variants and so forth. But that's our goal and that's our focus right now. Uh, we have time for one more question. And again, if we didn't ask your question in the Q&A today, 
uh, you will get a response directly. Um, this uh, final question is two part. Um, as the Office of Research DEI Committee, we're continuing to learn about the multitude of groups and resources available at the university. What efforts are the, is the university making to coordinate DEI work and minimize silos? Are there any recommendations to DEI committees? Well, we have a university-wide diversity council, faculty, students, and staff, and they have been responsible for developing the university's diversity framework, otherwise known as the diversity blueprint, which is tri-campus and its aspirations and is seeking to create an equitable environment across teaching and learning and research and service and outreach. Um, for the, the academic units have been asked to align with this diversity blueprint, which I believe you can easily find online. Um, and that alignment, of course, is challenging because the individual units are enterprising and, and their intellectual disciplines you know, have different ways of going about things. Uh, and in fact, a lot of colleges and schools now have, um, in their administrative units, they have their own associate or assistant deans as directors of diversity. And Ricky Hall, our diverse chief diversity officer, uh, meets regularly with these folks, and they share information, and they learn together, and they try to coordinate. Um, and we're just going to try to keep pushing in this direction. I, frankly, I'm hoping that more units will take up having chief diversity officers and beef up their capacity in their own units. And along with that, we want to make sure that they stay coordinated uh, with each other and with the campus's diversity blueprint. That's all the time we have for today's town hall. Uh, if you missed any of today's event, you can watch a replay at uw.edu slash provost slash town hall. Uh, thank you to our presenters, to Provost Richards. Uh, thank you for watching. Stay safe, get vaccinated, and go Huskies.